Welcome, everyone. I'm back. Last week was uh, Aaron and Alex, and I watched some of it. I wasn't able to watch all of it, but it was good. So um, I realize I don't need to do this every week. <laughs> it's, Facebook Lives are in, and videos are in good hands with uh, everybody else. So anyway, it's fun to be back. Uh, it's great weather today in Topeka, Kansas, so all is good. So, uh, we are still in the month of May, and we are promoting our Edgewater skirt and dress kits and classes. And remember, this is the Edgewater skirt from the April Project. I'm crazy about this skirt. Um, this is a black and white striped knit, and you can see that the way that it's cut out you barely have to match any stripes, maybe a little bit along the side seams, but certainly not at these important seams that create the structure to this skirt. And then the, and we do have, I think some, some of these kits left, don't we? Yeah, we do. And the May project is taking the skirt and making it into a dress. And here it is, and we have four five fabulous colorways in kits. This is the teal and green. We have a red and pink version, a saffron and green version, a black and white. Am I missing one? Maybe it's just four kits. Four kits, yeah. But the interesting thing about this is that here we have knit jersey, viscose jersey, for two of the parts of this dress. But this section is a simple cotton broadcloth. And the idea of sewing that sort of fabric to a knit is addressed in the video that I am filming Thursday. Uh, so this is, I'm saying this is May and this is June. So I'm a month off. This is May and this is June. Sorry about that. I'm all mixed up on my months. Um, but interesting thing about this fabric. So I spent last week in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is a glorious town and a place to be. And I went into all the great clothing shops there. And I am telling you that cotton poplin combined with knit or by itself is the fabric of the season. And sometimes it just sort of astonishes me. It's like it's in the water that designers know to use this kind of fabric in a particular season. And even little old us, you know, we somehow are on trend. And I think, I hope that you appreciate that about us, that we are staying current and we're trying to use the fabrics of the day and styles that are very popular and wearable. And I felt, I left Santa Fe feeling like we were really in good shape here at the sewing workshop that using these two types of fabrics together was just really something that was happening with a lot of emerging designers and top designers as well. So uh, you're in good hands, I think. So check out our classes for the skirt and the dress. So Confident can be uh, acquired as a monthly program, or single class, yearly, whatever. Also in Santa Fe, I want to tell you about something. Uh, I had a couple of experiences that were really incredible. And one was I went to the uh, Folk Art Museum, <clears throat> excuse me, and I've always been a follower of, of Alexander uh, Girard. In fact, I collect these wooden dolls of his. And I had no idea that he was so big into folk art. And so he had donated 100 pieces of folk art to this folk art museum. And one whole wing is dedicated to the entire collection of his. And I sat there and sketched a little bit and spent almost the whole day. You could spend almost a week there probably if you really studied things. But it was a really wonderful experience. In addition to that, I went to a gallery one evening called the Antio Gallery. And I hope that I'm s s uh, saying it correctly. I actually don't really know. But this is the website that you should check out, A-N-T-I-E-A-U, so I'm saying Antio, gallery.com. So when the person who was in charge of this trip that I was on said we're going to a gallery to see machine embroidery, I thought, well, that's interesting. You don't see very many machine embroidered things in a gallery. Well, 
I am telling you that this particular woman, who is Chris Roberts Antio, is a first-class machine embroiderer. The artwork that was in her gallery is all free motion embroidery. The pieces are enormous, small to enormous, but some of the big pieces are five and six feet square, and they're full of stitches. But this is sort of a typical image of what you see in that gallery and on her website. So I encourage you to go to the website and you'll see the top part of this particular, I'll call it painting, thread painting is really what it's called, and you'll see the intricacy of the machine stitches of this particular piece. I picked up a laminated, this is her business card sort of thing that I picked up, and one of the things I, I thought was fascinating about it is that this particular person, artist, is not art trained, not college trained, but followed her dream. She says she even had to repeat ninth grade. So she kind of writes her story about living her dream and hoping that people don't have fear about making things, uh, creating things. My mother was a uh, person who followed uh, handwriting, analyzed handwriting. And so I tend to do that every once in a while. And what I thought was interesting about this particular piece and the handwriting is it has lowercase, uppercase, script, block, a few commas missing, a few apostrophes missing. Maybe the grammar is not like perfect. It shows you that um, to be an artist, you just have to start and cr start creating and fail and make mistakes and all of that. And I think that applies to us as sewers as well. You know, it's a piece of fabric. We're afraid to cut into it. We're saving our great fabric. What are we saving it for? You know, I, I get the question all the time. Well, I want to make this in a muslin. What kind of muslin should I use? And I try to encourage people to just cut the fabric. There's always another piece of fabric. You want to make muslins out of similar type fabrics, if not the fabric. And if you are making good measurements of your body and the pattern, you're going to have a lot more success uh, rather than just jumping in and, and just saying, oh, I'm going to be a size such and such and I'll just make it. You know, there's some pattern work and, and details that have to be worked out. So I'm telling you that um, it's, it's okay to fail. And I've, I've made, I'm going to tell you about the experience that I had making what I have on because there I had a couple of failures. And it should be about the simplest thing I've ever done. So um, a couple of weeks ago, I, I'm on the email list for Eileen Fisher clothes. And this particular image came through. And I know that some of you have passed this image along to Betsy and me as well. So I, I knew that it was a popular style. And I looked at it and I thought, that is the simplest, cutest thing I've seen in a long time. Looks to me like it's a couple of rectangles. And sure enough, I'm pretty sure it is. So I took a, a, a look at what this is. And I decided to make, replicate this garment in a similar color and uh, see what would happen. So I'm going to tell you what I did. So this starts with the Hudson top pattern. Now the Hudson top pattern for us is in the printed pattern only. The Hudson pattern is a top and pants. I happen to have on the pants as well. So I have on the whole Hudson top and bottom thing. And that's the printed pattern. The Hudson download is pants only. So just take note of that. If you want to work with the Hudson top pattern, you're going to have to get the printed pattern or dig it out of your stash. So, but I decided that to um, get started on this, I would start with the Hudson because the Hudson top pattern is a very squarish, oversized garment. Now, in retrospect, I could have just uh, probably started with almost anything that had a neckline that I like because we, I ended up just simply making some rectangles. But let me show you what I did to this pattern. I decided that this needed to be oversized. I kind of studied this picture to see where the shoulder ended, and it was just right above the elbow. So I determined that by hanging a tape measure from my neck point to above my elbow, that was about 16 inches for me. 
So, or, or actually it was about um, 14 and a half inches actually finished. So I took the Hudson top pattern. This is, happens to be the front because it's a more scooped out neck. And I simply put a piece of paper over my pattern, traced the neckline of the Hudson, traced the center front fold line, and traced the length. And I determined that I wanted to start with a size medium because I wanted it to be a little bit oversized. Even though I know I can wear the Hudson in a small, probably even in an extra small, I can also wear an XXL in it. It's however, you, how, however large you want it, how much drape you want it, the fabrication that you're using. But I just sort of stuck in the middle there and used a medium. And I started with this point, and I drew a line perpendicular to this straight of grain center front line. Now, I, wanted, I knew I wanted 14 and a half inches. I also decided I wanted an inch and a half hem allowance. So that is 16 inches. So this line is 16 inches. I simply came down, even with the length that I wanted, and this length was the medium length. It could be any length that you want. But this is the length that you want in the front because you're gonna get a lot of drape on the sides. So I determined that the medium was the front length that I wanted. So you don't even have to know what this measurement is because it's simply coming from this point meeting up with the bottom hem. That is my pattern. It, this has a 5 8 inch seam allowance on it. This has inch and a half. And the hem on the Hudson is an inch and a half. You do the same thing for the back. It, the only difference is it just has a different tracing on the neck shape. Now, if you don't like the neck of the Hudson, because it is pretty open, you can raise it. You could raise it in the front a little bit. Or you could just take any other pattern that you like the neck shape of and trace that and come from this point and create your rectangles. It's that easy. You could even bring it in a little bit if you wanted to. Whatever shape fits over your head, you don't want to have to have a zipper or a keyhole opening or anything like that. Make it simple, something that goes over your head. So that was the pattern work. That took me longer to figure out than making it almost, almost. So I decided to use what we call here cross-dyed linen. And cross-dyed linen is made with two colors of, of fiber. The lengthwise fibers, or the warp, are white, in this case, and the crosswise threads are a color. And that creates a more muted, softer color, or a different tone than the color that you're gonna use, that has been used for the crosswise fiber. So cross-dyed linen, I, liked, I thought this felt like the feel of this garment, summery, it's cool, it can wrinkle and rumple. And so, per usual, I'm always in a hurry. And so I did not pre-wash the fabric, thinking, eh, you know, why? It doesn't, it's not a fitted garment, it doesn't matter if it shrinks later or whatever. So I got lazy and I cut it out and I, I started in. It's as simple as sewing the shoulder seams and finishing it, and then I finished the neck opening. I thought about uh, making a facing, and I quickly got rid of that idea, and I went to my stash of stuff in my drawers, and I found some single fold bias tape. Now this is the tape that folds twice single layer when it is open, but it has two finished edges when done. So because this little folded edge is less than a quarter of an inch, but about a quarter of an inch, I put this right sides together with the starting at the center back, folding the center, the, the end of this over just a little bit at the center back, and then laying this raw edge three-eighths of an inch from my original raw edge of the neck. And you know, it wouldn't have mattered if I'd lined it up with the edge. In fact, now that I've done it, I think that would be easier. But nevertheless, I had a line to follow to sew, that crease, keeping this little fold 
in place because that's going to be used later. So by the time I shaped that and sewed it around the neck, all I had to do was trim the seam, clip just a little bit through the uh, more dramatic curves at the shoulders, and then top stitched on that inner folded edge. And it turned out great. It's flat, it's nice, it's finished, you can't see it. And this, is, this costs, I don't know what, a couple of dollars. So you can make your own bias. Um, sometimes I do that on a really, really fine garment. But this is a, a casual throw-on garment. I'm going to use the, the cheap stuff here. So that was my neck finish. So after finishing the shoulders and the neck, then all I have to do is finish the four sides. And I did that by first, I've shown this on Facebook Live before, and it's all over our patterns and tutorials. But I used the inch and a half template first, and I just simply brought the raw edge of the fabric, laid this on the wrong side of the fabric, brought the raw edge of the fabric over to the top of this template, and pressed. And then I put the one inch, which is the finished hem width, put the one inch template in the crease that I just make and pressed over the additional half an inch. So I have finished hems. And then following the instructions in various patterns plus the Mastering Miter book, I mitered the corners on all four corners and top stitched it. So then I decided I, want, I knew I needed to make ties and I have various pieces of equipment, various notions to make, to turn tubes. Ballpoint bodkins, those things that have the little screw heads on the ends, I can't remember what the name of them is, tube turners of some variety. We all have tube turners. And so I cut one and a half inch wide strips of fabric, not on the bias, I sh that's technically what you're supposed to do, but I knew that these were straight, they didn't need to bend, and I, didn't, I only had cut two yards of fabric to begin with, and I only had about this much left. So I cut one and a half inch wide strips across the width of the fabric, including the selvages, and then I cut two of those, and I used then two strips to make four ties, so each one of them is about 30 inches long. And I started, I started sewing them together, like I always do, right sides together, so a narrow seam, and used my ballpoint bodkin to try to turn those tubes. Well, an hour later, I hadn't turned a single tube. It was ridiculous. In the meantime, I had decided that I wanted this to be washed, so I had thrown this in the washing machine, hoping I wouldn't ruin it for you today. And I was waiting on the washer anyway, so I continued to try to make tubes. Finally, I got out the famous bias tape maker thing. I own all of these in all the sizes. And this particular one makes single fold bias finished a quarter of an inch wide. Well, boy, did this work. So all I did was stick the single layer of fabric through the larger end of this little tool. And then I put my iron right here next to this opening. And you pull this, and you just follow the iron as you pull the device, and it creates this, two folded edges. So that then all I had to do was fold this again down the center and it just wants to do that on its own and I stitched on those raw edges and it was it was so so easy and then to make it even easier on myself at the ends I simply included the selvage at the ends of the ties so I didn't have to worry about knotting them or turning the edges in to slip stitch or whatever and I thought that was just fine so I have my poncho, as Eileen Fisher calls it, in cross-dyed linen, and I'm pretty happy with this. I'm wearing it with my Hudson pants in a slightly different cross-dyed linen. So the linen that I have on is this one, and the pants that I have on are this one. So we have three 
basic gray colors, light gray, a little more medium gray, and a darker gray. The, these two here have a bit of a slub in them. They're a little different character. And the, even though the lengthwise threads are white, the crosswise threads have some sort of a slub to them, a thick and thin and a little slub every once in a while. So you get a little more texture with these two, but not so much with the one that I have on on top. Do we want to take questions now or go through some of the rest of the fabrics? Um, we just have a few questions. Okay. By the way, all of the instructions for how to make this top are on the blog. So that's free to you. You can check out our blog and you'll get everything you need to know to make this top. Including yardage and... Yardage <laughs> and notions. Yes. Okay. Somebody did ask about yardage. I yeah. Think it was two, yards two yards is what I took home from here and that was plenty. I had... By the time I cut all the ties because I couldn't get the first two... <laughs> well, first of all, I cut them at one inch and that was wrong. And then I cut them at one and a half, and then I tried to turn them, and that didn't work. So by the time I cut like six widths of tubes, um, I didn't have any fabric left, actually, so, out of two yards. Can we show where you place the ties? Yeah, the ties actually are sewn to the inside of the hem. Not at the outer edge, but the inner side of the hem. And I had to put this on to decide where I wanted to put the ties. After I had made this, I realized that it would have been kind of fun to make the front shorter and the back longer, but I wasn't smart enough to figure that out ahead of time. But that would be a good look. I'll show your whole outfit yeah. too. And I'm wearing this over a very simple tank, so I have another little layer that separates these two fabrics. This is just a cotton knit tank. But you can see the sides and my heads and pants that I've put the pockets in. I use the West End pockets in my heads and pants, which is the February So Confident Series 11 project. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll zoom back in. And in the, on the blogs, you mentioned how far, you said you, um, what, what, do you know the approximate? Uh, I do know. It's ten and a half mean? inches for me. Okay. Okay. Uh, it could be different on everyone. But it just, so I think you have to put it on and decide where you want the ties. But for me, it was ten and a half inches. I don't say that in the blog. I just say put it on and determine it. But I do remember that it was ten and a half inches. What happened to it when you washed it? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it got a little bit softer, which is what I wanted. Just a little bit. It, I think, Erin and I were talking about this yesterday about linens, actually. You know, the big thing about linen is they wrinkle. Okay, we get that. I think that linens wrinkle differently and better and more attractively after they're washed. There's not that hard crease. It's a softer rumple. And that is the look that I do prefer. But I don't bother to press my linen pants from wearing to wearing. Uh, or tops even, sometimes a top, but not so much for pants. So after I've washed them, I, I'm, I'm ready to leave it in its sort of what it's supposed to be form. I do recommend that you wash and dry linen once. Then if you continue to wash the garment, I don't necessarily dry the garment. I think that linen can wear out. Linen is kind of a short staple and it's not a super strong fiber and so it can break down over time. That can be good or bad. Uh, sometimes garments get really soft over time. It's because they're beginning to break down. But they get even more comfortable. But I don't always, I don't really ever dry my garments separately, I, or in a second. I don't, I wash my garments more than once, but I, I only maybe dry the garment once the first time. Can't talk this morning for some reason. <laughs> Do you have a particular way that you wash the linen? No, I just throw the uh, fabric in the washer with my regular detergent in, you know, warm water. And then I always have a low setting on my dryer no matter what I'm doing. But nothing, nothing special. Um, was there a shapes pattern that was similar to this poncho? 
Well, interesting that you should bring that up um, because I actually got out my high five jacket shapes pattern thinking that that would be the starting point. That has a different neckline to it. It has a more angular neckline. You have to find the center front of that, which is where the button is placed, and determine that as your center front. But I did dig it out, and it did give me a sense of what to do. So I sort of made that decision for you. You could start with the high five pattern and put the, any neckline on it that you want. In my case, I thought it was a little bit easier to start with the neckline shape that I wanted first and adapt that pattern into a, a rectangle. But yes, the high five pattern was a pattern that I had out and I was looking at it and studying it and figuring out what I wanted to do. So a question about the Hudson pants. Um, how do you make them look so slim? I have a large stomach and skinny legs and the extra large just seems like it has so much fabric. Do you have any suggestions? Um, well. You can always use, you can always uh, taper the legs of any pants, including the Hessen pants, to a different size. So let's say you're an XL in the body of the pants, you can trim those legs down to an extra small if you want to. I mean, you can get those legs, I happen to make the same size, because I'm pretty sort of proportioned between my hips and my legs, but lots of times at workshops here, I am tapering legs both uh, inseam and outer seam, tapering them down to a smaller size. One of the sort of hazards of grading is that, you know, when you grade at, let's say, the hips, which is where you start for fitting pants, then legs are graded as well, when that's not always necessary. A lot of people don't need extra large legs. What are your shoes? My <laughs> shoes are sneakers. <laughs> My shoes are Golden Goose Show sneakers, them. white with silver yeah. stars. That shoe is everywhere. It is everywhere. The star thing on the side, mm -hmm. you know, Converse started it, what, 50 years ago, 70 years ago? But yeah. There we go. Okay, should we look at five? Okay, so I pulled out about 11 cross-dyed linens all of which have this common denominator of the white warp fiber. We have a lot of other um, cross-dyed linens in our inventory, but they were two different colors, not white. So I decided to stay with what I consider sort of the summer fresh look, and so I pulled out the colors that I think are really fantastic. So I mentioned the three um, grays, any of which can be tops, or pants. Any of these can be tops or pants. So, all right, so here's this pale icy uh, green, which I think is just beautiful with this pale gray. This is a beautiful blue. What do we call this blue? Kind of a sky blue. Turqu we call it turquoise. Um, in the painting world, this would probably be cobalt blue, uh, but uh, watered down. And then, of course, this is my pant, which is the more medium gray or the more textured gray. And I really think I might have to have a pair of pants out of this darker gray. I, I find that, that gray, at least in the summer, for me, is the black pants. You know, well, they go with everything. They go, go with cool colors, warm colors, everything. Then over here, we have a light raspberry color that we call magenta. This is lavender. See, the, the cross thread in this is dark purple, but when you put the white warp with it, it it's a, now a pastel, and it's lavender. Same here. This is lime green, and with the white, it's a very, very soft, I don't know what we call it. Oh, here. Uh, we're calling it honeydew green. That's a great name for it, actually. This is more of a peach color. And this one is a beautiful taupe. Not, it's a warmer color than these grays. More brown, more taupe. Putty, concrete, those kind of colors. 
And then we have a little bit of yardage left of this one, which is garnet. So those are our fabrics. So can you read off the names of the specific gray colors that you're wearing? Yes. So my top is sea salt. My pants, salt and pepper. My next pair of pants, midnight spec. And how wide are these fabrics? These are all essentially 60 inches. Now notice that the gray ones have the great selvage. This one, this one, this one, and this peach one does. The other selvages I don't think are quite as usable. But these have that almost woven tape-like selvage to them. I think I'll get a close-up of some of these colors All right. so they can see the difference in the grays. See if the colors can be accurate. Someone was saying that the grays look a little more taupe. Um, I consider these silver grays. Not helping. <laughs> wouldn't, you, wouldn't you call these silver mm -hmm. grays? Right, especially when you put them next to the taupe, more taupe. Yeah, one. so compare that to this one. And this one is definitely more brown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to move around a bit just to see if I can get it to be more accurate. OK. OK. Now we have um, a couple of tutorials that are pretty interesting. One of which I haven't talked about at all and has never been on the website, but we just put it there. And it's called Signature Techniques. And this is just a potpourri of our techniques that we talk about over and over and that I do over and over, including hemming with templates, mitering corners, and a whole slew of other things. So that is a tutorial that's on sale this week, and it's never been published before. And then we have the loop and tube, loops and tubes tutorial about how to make ties. I do see another question. Yeah. Um, did you serge your sh shoulder seams? I did. I sewed my shoulder, shoulder seams, and then I serge finished the edges together with a three thread, with three threads. Yeah. And then I pressed the seam towards the back, as you normally would. Connie says, the gray looks great on you. The color is great. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, as I get older, it seems like I can wear any color. It, I think that's because I'm getting blinder. And uh, I don't care as much. You just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing a lot more different colors than I used to. I'm, I'm sort of breaking all the rules. And you're right. I, can wear, I, I think I can wear this color. And this is a color that would be deadly on me if someone were analyzing my colors and doing my colors. What colors besides the gray would Linda recommend putting together for the top and bottom? OK, well, let's look at that. Um, well, I would put this with this. I would make a top in this and blue pants. That would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I would do. Of course, I would put this <laughs> with anything, but particularly the gray, this light gray for pants. I love those together. I think this is an interesting combination, top mm -hmm. and bottom or bottom or top, either one. I like that one. You like that that's one? That's the one yeah, I was that, thinking. That's, that's Aaron's for mm -hmm. sure. I'm a little bit over here. <laughs> Aaron's over here. <laughs> but she has on a purple dress today, so there you go. <laughs> Let me see if there's any other questions. Do you know how many yards they need for the poncho and the pants? Well, it's two yards for the poncho and uh, two yards for the pants, I think, isn't it? I think it's 
Or is it two and a quarter? It might be two and a quarter. So you'd have to get, mm -hmm. if you got two, four, well, if you got five yards of fabric, you'd have plenty. You mm -hmm. probably, you might be able to get it out of four yards mm -hmm. because of the extra that you would have because of the poncho. Probably could get it out mm -hmm. of four yards, depending on your size. Everybody's you must have listened to last <laughs> week when they talked about the same, using the same fabric for top and bottom. <laughs> You talked about that. We did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody's coming up with some really good color combinations. The lime and peach. Yes. Pink and orange. Coral and gray. Yeah. Everybody's coming up with some really good options. Okay. So what are the specials? All right. Specials are all the fabrics. The 11 uh, cross-dyed linens are on sale. Oh, I didn't show the other garments that you can make. Oh, yes. Well, let's, let's, let's back up a little bit. First of all, this is the Hudson Top pattern in its original form. So this is the pattern I have used to make this. Minus the cowl, minus the sleeves, and boxed out. Okay. Sorry about that. I meant to show that early on. But here's a pattern that we don't talk about very much, and this is the Inventor shirt. And I saw this style all over Santa Fe. So I have the feeling we're going to be seeing this pattern uh, reviewed again. But lots of patterns and shirts have this pocket. You can eliminate this little tab in the neckline if you want to and open it up. You could even take off the collar and have an open neck. This I probably could have worked with another pattern to make this poncho, but I didn't. This is the bells of the bells and whistles and I think this would look great in the cross-eyed linen. This could even be in a couple of the colors. You could have the body of the shirt in one of the colors and then feature a contrasting color for the plackets and the ties, maybe the under cuff, under collar and so forth. That would be really beautiful. And then this one is the San Diego top and this is in a somewhat of a cross-dyed linen already. So you can see how, how pretty that is. All of these are lightweight. None of these are heavy pant weight, although I wear them for pants. These are not heavy linens. These are, these are lightweight linens. They're not handkerchief linens in that they're sheer, but they are definitely lightweight. They're perfect for summer. Uh, and what, what linen would you, like what color would you pair with the taupe? I believe that's what the what question. color would I pair with the taupe? Well, I do like the peach with it. I, I honestly think you can wear this with anything. I think it's really pretty with the blue. I think it's pretty with the light aqua, the green. I'm not sure there's a bad color with them, actually. But I do like this peach with it. And this, I think this, uh, no, I don't like that so well. The purple's good with it, the lavender, for a cool co color. But green, peach, these four would be really pretty with it. Okay, I was talking about specials. So let's go back to that. Okay, and then we <laughs> can finish up with a couple questions. Okay, so specials are all the fabrics, the 11 fabrics. And so the patterns, Hudson, printed pattern, top and bottom. If you're wanting just the pants, it's the digital Hudson. That's not on sale. Is the digital on sale for Hudson? Yes, it was. I saw it okay. in the category. All mm -hmm. right. Um, the bells and whistles pattern, the San Diego pattern, and the inventor pattern. So all the shirts that I just showed you, all four of those patterns, all five of those patterns are on sale. Then the two tutorials, the signature techniques, and the loops and tubes. Those tutorials are on sale as well. Okay. Now for questions. Okay. Um, do you know what the width of the top is, assuming it's not the full 60 inches? No, width. well, I don't know exactly what the width is uh, because I don't know this distance right here. Mm -hmm. This is 16 inches and then it's whatever that is. But I honestly didn't measure that. And doubled, okay. Mm -hmm. And then it's doubled, yeah. But it's, you know, you can see um, it's, it's plenty wide. But you, that's what you need to get these tails. You have to think oversized. You can't get possessed about size here.
And you sew the poncho from midway to the bottom in lieu of ties. Sure. You could sew it from here. You could even sew it several inches in if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. You could sew it along the edges or sew it two or three inches, four inches in from the edge down. Absolutely. But I would leave, I would do that and then um, leave that to be op um, lie open, I guess. Like the big, big, big seam is pressed open to the outside is what it would look like. And again, the white top that you have underneath, that's a store-bought? Yeah, yeah, this is just a simple mm -hmm. white tank knit that I bought someplace mm -hmm. 30 years ago. <laughs> and then, can you um, just again bring the inventor out? Yeah. The, oh, oh the, the inventor? The inventor. Mm -hmm. Somebody just wanted to verify that that's what that was. That's one we don't ever talk about. So. No. The reason these buttons are here is that it's pictured with this button-on skirt, as we call it. So that's what you see when you see the pattern on our website. But if you don't make the skirt and don't attach it, then this is the shape of it. Mm -hmm. This is flattering on, on everybody. It's really a cool pattern. Okay. That's all oh. I see. Okay. Well... Glad to be back, glad you're back, and I will see you next week.